Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this happy St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2024. Let us now prepare to come into the presence of God, taking a moment of silence so that we may make our own individual confessions. Anyone who stands with Christ and is born again is a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Well, it seems like we probably have quite a few prayers, but um, let me start by taking those from each of you and adding them to the prayer. Does anybody have somebody they'd like to pray for? Yes. My brother-in-law, Jim, uh, looks like he has, well, he has tumor on his kidney. So we're praying for him. Mm, I'm so sorry. And praying for our friend, my brother-in-law, uh, Ken Walsh. Uh, he's, he also has a high problem, but he still has the side of the brain left. What's your sister's name? Grace. Grace. She's had her urology. She she has uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, sure. She was born with that urology. She kind of has that. Yeah. And she now she wants to be on the drive and stuff like that. So we're looking for her. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Mm-hmm. Uh, the folks in the hospital that are still uh, pretty weak and uh, that tumor is just kind of carrying them down. So that's going to be a long journey to try to get that together. And then uh, my friend Jane that has a little ALS, she's kind of nailed down. She really is going downhill really fast. We'll pray for the family of Cindy Coleman, too. You may know her as a former moderator of the Presbyterian Church. Uh, she posted on social media that her uh, brother died at 48 this week, just completely unexpectedly. Um, very sudden death, so I'm sure there will be an autopsy and all that, but um, those kinds of deaths are very hard on everyone. So we'll pray for her family. Anybody else? Pray for you. Yay. I was waiting for someone to say that. Of course we pray for Retro. Ceaselessly. And I've already got on here the uh, countries facing some unrest. Oh, you are? No. Yeah. I didn't have a drill to uh, nerve drilling and a cap. Yeah, I got to have a, uh, a root canal. Root canal. So medical procedures. I feel like my liver is just kind of run up, so I'm going to take something else to run up. <laughs> <laughs> Insurance, my friend. It is worth a lot. I used to think dental insurance was so expensive until we hit the age where we started needing actual <laughs> dental care. And then I said, oh, okay, this is actually saving me a lot of money. <laughs> but it took a while to get there. Um, anything else? Okay. Let's pray. 
Lord God, we come to you with uh, much on our hearts and minds this morning, some of which we chose to share aloud. We pray first for our world. It's uh, a time of great unrest around the world, Lord, and uh, there are quite a few places that may come to our minds that we could be in prayer for, and I I know you know what we don't say aloud, but uh, specifically, certainly the people of Haiti, of Ukraine, and of Gaza and Israel, um, all of those areas are effectively at war of some kind. You know the situations, Lord. You know the needless loss of life that has gotten so extreme in all of these places. Please make meaning from that and intercede, protecting those who are innocent. Lord, we pray as well uh, for those in our lives that we know and those that we don't. We pray for brother-in-law Jim and his wife Grace, uh, for Jim's eyes and kidneys, uh, which harbor possible cancer, for grace, just for the strength and comfort it requires to be a caregiver. We pray for Brother Dave, who's home from the hospital, for friend Jane and her husband Mike as Jane battles ALS. We pray for the family of Cindy Coleman in the wake of her brother's very sudden death, so young. We pray for our very own Richard as he continues with the challenges of Parkinson's. And for Rob, not only with uh, the unknown of dental procedures, but also that he cope with any costs. Lord, we pray for these special requests, and we pray for things left on our hearts and minds that you know may trouble us. And we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not on temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I'm not sure if I failed to send it in, which could be the truth, But your order of worship is missing one thing today, which I will just share anyway, and that is Psalm 19 is our Old Testament scripture. I'm sure it wasn't. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern his errors? Clear thou me from hidden faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So this first scripture, a psalm, lays the groundwork well for today because it talks about the works of God, getting us thinking about the foundation of our faith, which then leads me to share Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, through to chapter 2, verse 10. And this is when you hear I, this is from the author of Ephesians. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe, according to the working of his might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you he made alive when you were dead through the trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among these, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind. And so we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not because of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word of our Lord. Well, I love the fact that these scriptures today are sort of a back to basics for all of us. When you think of God, what comes to your mind? For me, a big part of my impression is that God is far more infinite in every sense than we can put into words. Perhaps this is why we sometimes struggle to believe it's easy to believe in something that is manageable, that we can put our head around, that is entirely rational and easy to see. In addition, though, we look at times of struggle and we are quick to blame God. When we face pain or hardship, it can be a real challenge that hits us at the core of our faith to make any sense of that at all. We ask, why is God allowing this suffering? It might not even be our suffering. It could be suffering for someone we love. But we ask why. Sometimes we find meaning and purpose over time. And sometimes we really don't. Sometimes we struggle and come to realize 
We will not know everything in this life. Remembering that God is with us in everything can be helpful. We are never alone. By faith, we have a constant companion. The book of Ephesians, which is comprised of one letter to the church at Ephesus, has an origin story that we've never been able to completely 100% prove. And I think in a way that makes it a little bit more in interesting. We know from many, many scholars on the subject that it was written to the church at Ephesus, and we know it was written specifically to the Gentile church members because of some of the content of it. The author's aim, as always, is to build up the congregation to strengthen their faith. Tradition says that the Apostle Paul, the man himself, wrote this letter from prison, probably prison in Rome, around the year AD 62. But there have been later scholars who have challenged this, many of them, in fact. And those scholars say that the authorship is probably actually later, just after Paul died. In their belief, it is that Paul inspired the letter, and it's in the context of his church ministries and itinerant as an evangelical between 33 and 62 that really led to this. This would place this between 80, 70, and 80. In part, they say, because this letter is more impersonal than his actual proven letters, that they think this means somebody else probably wrote it. The scholars who talk this way note the way that Ephesians begins and the fact that there aren't the normal greetings. He doesn't make the salutations that other authors have made. No matter which origin story is held, however, the content of Ephesians doesn't change at all. It's clear that the teachings of Paul, who converted to faith in Christ around 33 CE and began his ministry right away, are foundational to Ephesians. And that's one of the reasons I think it's a very good book to study. There are certain books of the Bible that may not be as important, but I think books like Romans and Acts that were meant to be foundational to the newly building Christian church, and letters like Ephesians, which get to the heart of the Christian message so well, are very important and maybe not given enough time sometimes. Ephesians was most likely meant to be a circular letter. Now, you have to put this in context to remember people were not talking about Jesus on the street corners. That could get you tortured, arrested, or worse. So they were meeting in churches, small group settings, in people's homes. And a letter like this would be read aloud. It would be passed among the churches and shared. Written in Greek, the language most popular then, among the people hearing it, even if not everyone gathering could read, which probably is the case, we know. A letter like this could be read aloud, so the congregants would hear it just like you did today. And that is most likely how the most important foundational messages of the Bible were passed. This means that they weren't always reading God's message for themselves. Much like we hear of Catholic churches that do everything in Latin, this would be the Bible read aloud. But the big difference is we can assume that everyone present spoke Greek. We cannot assume everybody was speaking Latin that was hearing the Catholic Mass. Thankfully, none of these semantics change the central message. The letter praises the faith of the congregants very early on. It praises how they love each other and other Christians. We can infer from that 
that perhaps this was a group known for their charity. Remember that back then, a very important part of the financial part of churches was sustained by each house church paying into some sort of offering that was used to evangelize. So the fact that they are praised for their faith may be partly because they were financially generous. That would have been very typical and something that Paul, when you read through the whole Bible, mentions periodically rather subtly, but does bring up because he's relying on these churches to pay any travel expenses, such as food, for example. The author of this text hopes for good things for all believers. He speaks in verse 19 of, quote, the immeasurable greatness of his, meaning God's, power in those of us who believe. And he reminds us all of the resurrection. You see, that's something we don't do that much today unless we're doing a sacrament or we're celebrating something like Easter. But the heart of our story is what is to come while we are in Lent. It is the resurrection. What are we all doing this for if there's no resurrection? The resurrection makes meaning and purpose and a better understanding of Jesus' time on earth. The author also speaks of something that liberal to conservative, the entire gamut, our own personal stories link well to because he talks about our own personal rebirth. Now, evangelicals talk a lot about being born again, and some evangelicals have a story of that. They don't necessarily believe that they were born already evangelized or evangelized it from infancy. They believe that they had a come to Jesus moment at some point, usually in their late teens or very early adulthood, and that that personal rebirth story we share is a huge part of Christ coming alive in our lives. In that time, we usually talk about some form of God's cleansing of our sins, which very interestingly is also in Ephesians. Ephesians speaks of how God cleanses our sin. And we might ask, why is it so important to always talk about this? Well, human beings are, by definition, sinful. And now I know this is going to shock you. I've got to take my glasses off for this one. But even Christians are always sinning. The reality is we don't think about that that much because it's not that comfortable to say, I am a sinner, you are a sinner. So we don't use that language very often if you think about it. We might in our prayers that we ourselves are claiming, but we don't go through day-to-day -day life always claiming what we could. When we claim that, we realize what a big deal Jesus Christ really is. Because this man is choosing his life and allowing his resurrection. He's going forth willingly through all of the stages that we now call Easter his arrest, his torture, his imprisonment, the denial by some of his greatest friends and followers. He goes through all of that and even speaks to God about it at one point in the story, knowing that the cup is not going to pass from him. This must happen to fulfill the story. But more importantly, it must happen to cleanse how sinful we are, not how sinful he is. That's very important. Not too many people are ready to die for someone else's problem. Usually we call them martyrs. We single them out because it's so unusual to have a person willing to do that. In the case of Jesus, we have it a whole other level because he's fully human and fully divine. So he has no sin. And yet, even sinless, blameless, he still says, to his father. If this is your will, I will submit. And he does. And in that, we get the true cleansing of all Christians. We remember it in our baptism. We remember it in our communion. But the sacraments are only 
acting out what Jesus has already done for each one of us. In fact, the way we choose our two uh, uh, sacraments in Christianity under the Presbyterian Church is based in the biblical foundation that those are the two things that Jesus instituted. That is how we end up with the sacraments we do, and not everyone knows that. In this saving power of Jesus, then, we receive the ultimate gift, which is, of course, salvation. The letter that I read states that as Christ was risen, we then have been raised to new life. And that is very important because many of us still don't live like a redeemed people. We get ourselves quagmired down in bickering about politics or thinking the world is coming to an end some days, and we forget that we have already been redeemed. I had a very interesting experience to see this in a different set of eyes recently because as many of you know, I often will work with churches in our presbytery that uh, are kind of in a gap of their leadership is how I phrase it, um, where I'm not really the interim pastor and I'm not really installed, but I'm some form of stated supply or long-term coverage when there is a hole there for any number of reasons. And in this presbytery, I have done that several times now, probably at least four or five churches over the years I've lived here. And it gives me a lot of joy. I get to go on and see them then go for me to someone long-term who's installed. Um, and it's wonderful to companion along with them uh, because much like the house churches of Paul's time, the Presbyterian church does not like to leave any congregational group floundering. And so we prefer to have some leadership in place that has the love and respect of the congregation. And if they have nobody, we send in somebody like me often to be kind of stated supply and fill that gap for a bit. Well, recently we've had a church that really needed our support a great deal. Uh, they had sold their property they were meeting um, in a, a space that really is almost like an office park. They're, they're not in a church. Um, and I was asked to start working with them. Um, and it's been a very exciting time. Um, some of my, really the majority, the way it worked out, of work with them has been outside of worship hours because there were a lot of things like infrastructure that they needed help with. And as all of us know who've done it, that turns into lots of phone calls and typing emails and uh, liaisoning that doesn't happen in the middle of preaching on Sunday morning. But we have brought them a really long way. And so very excitingly, uh, I just spoke to some leadership in the Presbytery this week, and uh, we've moved on to the phase of looking for a new church for them somewhere in Hillsborough County. Um, and... Uh, probably with one of our existing congregations that's particularly strong, but to see how much they have grown from being a little band of disciples, uh, feeling very adrift, really, um, and having a list of goals and aspirations to now slowly getting on their feet. They have a wonderful session um, and now looking to get back into a church uh, it's very exciting stuff. All of this is to say that um, I may not be here as much in the future because I'm ending up giving them a lot of my time. Um, but I love to think of the way that we, we as the Presbyterian Church, live out scriptures like the story I read today from Ephesians. The text tells us about how we are born again. And I want you to think in terms of the good works of God, because one of the good works of God is that we can be born again, again. We can renew our faith and be reinvigorated right from birth to death and life beyond in heaven. There is never a time as Christians, never, that we can't claim God for ourselves. 
And to me, that's one of the very exciting parts of being Protestant. It is a very personal experience of God. It is a very personal experience of the resurrection. And the renewal that happens if we claim it is almost beyond description, truly. Studying our Bible is one of the ways we get closer to that. And hopefully, by giving you just a little glimpse of that in today's scripture, I've made it more obvious what I mean. But even if you read it aloud, a verse like today's just imbues you with such strength of what the gospel is based on. Because it's not just meant for those people then, back in A.D., whichever year we choose, it's meant for us today. And I strongly believe that scripture was always intended like that. God was inspiring these authors to create what was to come. It is not a surprise to me that over 2,000 years later, we're talking about some of these things. That is not surprising to me at all. This morning, I was coming here, and I passed this pond that I always pass. But I looked over, and I'm pretty sure I saw an alligator stretched out on the bank. What was interesting about this was not the alligator. I know there's over a million of those in Florida. The thing that was interesting was that pond doesn't usually have a bank. Normally, without this sort of little snap of heat wave we've been having, it's very full of water. You wouldn't even know it had a sandy bottom because you can't see any of that. You're looking at water that goes right into grass. But today, because we've had so much heat, a significant drop, more than a foot of water level had dropped in this pond. And I was looking at that alligator, and of course I had to drive on. I was in a car at the time. When the light changed, I kept thinking about him. And I thought, you know, that alligator might actually be on the bank because there is minimal water in that pond. He might not even be trying to get sun right now. He might just be responding to the fact that the water level is low and thinking, well, I might as well flop on the sand because there's not that much to swim in. Well, I say this with the little analogy that sometimes our lives are like that. Sometimes our lives don't have enough water and we are busy trying to figure out if we flop on the sand or we keep swimming. And what I would say to you is to remember your baptism. No matter what you are facing this morning, no matter what you walked in here thinking about, no matter what you've been struggling with this past week since we were last together, God will provide the water. If you give our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the time to build your faith, God will provide the water. And truly, when we think of having a companion for the rest of our lives, it comes down to having the water. Amen. Do we have announcements? Uh, just that uh, I'm going to be at Mitchell's on Sunday during uh, the last Sunday of my teaching and speaking there. Uh, we'll do some joint service for Easter. So Easter is a joint service. We have one more worship here, uh, though not with me, with somebody else, for Palm Sunday um, this month. And... Uh, yeah, we are marching on. And pretty soon, our friend will come back from Korea, so we will gain another member. And we can always give thought to gaining a few more. Um, I don't know if some of the people who aren't here today are more bilingual, and so maybe they sometimes worship upstairs. Because um, I have a couple of times seen people that have come to this service actually be on the grounds, but they weren't in this worship. So I think that they went upstairs, maybe. Um, so I'm not sure about that. But anyway, I wanted to mention that. We may have a couple of folks that are just worshiping upstairs, but they're still around. And uh, Sometimes we'll see. Services, most of the time, they're not, but it's oh, yeah, that's true. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, if you ever wanted to, you could do just a postcard and drop it in all the homes for five or six blocks around and just invite English speakers because I've talked to many people, even people who say they live in Pinellas Park, and they don't know that there is a way to worship here in English. They're not aware of that. So if you ever want to be more evangelical yourselves, you could do, you know, a half-page flyer. I mean, there's a lot of ways to just make a little invitation and let the neighbors know you're here, you know. It's up to you. <laughs> you're all looking at me like, why would we do that? <laughs> you all have a funny look on your faces. Okay, well, you don't have to invite anybody or ever open your door to anybody, but if you wish to, I'm just planting that seed. I mean, the looks on your faces are hilarious. Is there anything else anybody wants to share? Let's have the benediction. Oh, Lord God, you are such a good God, and you do bring humor into so many situations, as we discussed earlier. Whether desiring to grow or not, may you continue to keep this group strong, that they know by their faith that they are deeply and wonderfully made and loved by you, that you companion them on life's journeys, that by the waters of your baptism, you do know of the good works of God. May you go forward knowing just how good God has made you. Amen. <laughs>